What's up, guys? It is Dr. Seth, and we're back with another round of answering your questions from my Instagram AMA. So let's get into it with question number one. Would you rather never squat again or never do the hanky-panky again? And I think the big thing that you guys need to understand about this question is that I don't even know if I enjoy squatting. Like at this point in my powerlifting career, I am 13 years into it and I am very, very, very excitedly awaiting the day that I accomplish my goals so that I never ever have to put a heavy barbell on my back again. Like when I'm done powerlifting, I am done powerlifting. I'm gonna take up something else where I can push myself and do cool things because really for me, it's not even that I do this because I like squatting. I squat good because I like accomplishing things and squatting is a proxy that allows me to work hard and achieve my goals. So the big thing is, is like, I want to achieve goals. I don't care if that is a squat, even though like the squat is the thing that I have my sights set on right now in terms of the athletic side of things. So yeah, I will totally be fine if I get to the point where I never touch a barbell again. I'm just not at that point yet. So don't take this the wrong way because I still have shit to do in powerlifting. And for question number two, programming guidelines for those with high stress lives slash low recovery. And I think that like the big thing that we got to think about is that no matter what someone's life looks like, no matter what their recovery capabilities look like, as a coach, it's our job to work to match the program towards what they're capable of recovering from and then giving them enough stimulus that it causes an adaptation without totally kicking the shit out of them. No matter what their life looks like, no matter what their recovery capabilities look like, if we do that, that person is going to be able to get better. Now, the next thing that I want to think about is that I think it's less about how stressful someone's life is on paper and more about how stressful they perceive their life to be and how resilient they are to life's stressors. Because in my experience, coaching a lot of people that have really gnarly lives, that have really gnarly work schedules, that are up at 4 a.m. every day, busting ass, working construction, working on power lines, just doing gnarly shit, the people that do more gnarly shit in their lives, they tend to be able to handle training better. And all I can really equate that to is that even though their life might be more demanding, because their life is demanding, they're more resilient to stressors. They're more used to just being able to handle shit. They're more used to just saying, I can freaking handle this. And because they're used to saying, I can freaking handle this, they tend to handle stuff well. Whereas if we have people who aren't used to being uncomfortable, who aren't used to feeling fatigued, who aren't used to just doing hard stuff, if they're placed in situations where they have to handle stuff harder than they're used to, if they have to be more fatigued than they're used to, if they're not used to it, it's going to freak them out. They're going to get more stressed out by it. And then we're probably going to have to pull them back more than we would expect compared to someone who is resilient to handling stressors, whether that be training, whether that be life. So I think big picture, match the program to the person's life, to the person's recovery capabilities as best you can. You'll know if you're doing a good job of that if they're getting better. You know you're doing a poor job of that if they're getting their ass is kicked and then basically just try to build them up over time so they can become more resilient and can begin to handle more and kind of on the back of that one question number three opinion of benching every day now are we talking seven days a week or like on a normal three to five day powerlifting split and just benching on every single one of those three to five days and if we're talking seven days a week I can't think of a very good reason that I would want someone to do that. But on the back of the last question, if you are benching seven days a week, you are able to recover from it, you are able to progress, and it's working, sure, do it if you want to. I personally wouldn't, I personally wouldn't want to, I personally wouldn't want to prescribe it to anyone, but if it actually is working and you actually are progressing, why the hell not? Now, as far as benching like four days a week on a four day program or five days a week on a five day program, three days a week on a three day program, it definitely can work very well. Again, if someone is able to recover from it and handle it. And if we do have some sort of undulation on the days, whether that be via exercise selection, loading or volume, there are intelligent ways that we can program it. This isn't gonna be a deep dive on frequency programming. So I'm not gonna get into that here, but I am a fan of it. And I do have a lot of lifters who do bench three to four days a week right now. And those again are the lifters that can handle it, that can recover from it and are making progress with it. And the biggest reason that I have 
have those lifters benching on a high frequency is they are lifters that respond very well to having that extra technical practice. They like to feel in the groove, they like to feel dialed in, and the more opportunities we give them to get dialed in, the more dialed they get and the better they do with it. We just need to be mindful that if we are benching with that frequency, that we aren't overstepping what they can handle from day to day to day. And for question number four, we got another bench question. Outsides of feet keep lifting in the bench. How to maintain a flat foot during the rep with USAPL rules. So if you're familiar with USAPL, you aren't familiar with IPF, or I guess USAPL isn't an IPF affiliate anymore, but that kind of federation, you need to have your feet planted through the whole rep on the bench. You can't do the toe pick bullshit that I like so much with my own bench. So we need to find a way that we can have the feet stuck to the floor the entire freaking time without moving. And I know I'm trying to like example of feet not moving and I'm wiggling my hands. This is what you do not want. You want this not this when you're benching in those federations. So I ended up creeping your page and I wanted to look at how your foot setup is and how things look. And you have a pretty toed out position and you have pretty strong leg drives. Like as you're driving with that toe out, you're rolling in and feet are coming up. Like you already know this because it's happening to you and you're getting called for it. So I don't need to tell you that. But I think that the easiest solution looking at where things are stacking and where things are going is if you just pointed the feet straight, make, made your knees go out just a little bit, you probably could be able to just create leg drive and like that way and not have that roll in happening. So I think looking at it, it should be a pretty simple fix. And if you can't get your feet straight when you're benching and you can't get your knees out a little bit, I would just work on your hips, whether that be just pure ability to get the knees out in abduction, whether that be a little bit of hip IR to be able to get the feet more straighter. One or the other, work on that if you can't get there. If you can get there, sick, just put your feet straight and they should stop rolling in on you. And for question number five, we're going to get a little bit conjugate Do you typically only pull max effort deadlifts after speed squats? And if so, why? And this is kind of one of the questions that I don't really like because with conjugate, people that don't get it love to try to fit things in boxes and say, this is the only place this thing goes. This is the only way this can be done. And this is the only way that this can ever work. And if you think that about conjugate, you will undoubtedly fail. You will screw it up because you are missing the freaking point of the entire system. And the point of the entire system is to be able to adapt it and modify it to your current needs. And where I put my max effort deadlifts is going to be dependent on how my pulls are feeling in training and how often I feel like I'm needing to pull. If I'm needing to pull every week, if I'm needing to pull heavy every week, I'm going to fit that max effort deadlift on a day that I'm not max effort squatting. And if I am running a normal upper lower conjugate split, the only day that I can fit a max effort pull that isn't on the same day as my max effort squat is after my dynamic effort pull. So that's why it goes in those slots if I am squatting and pulling heavy on the same week. It's not like there's some magic to it. It's not like there's some whatever blah, 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 blah going on. It's just... If I need to pull and squat heavy in the same week, that is the slot that it fits in. So that is the slot that I'm going to put it in. And the reason that I put my max effort pull after my speed squats and not the other way around is that if I do a true max effort pull, I'm going to be fucking shittered and I'm not going to do very good on speed squats. But if I do my speed squats before my max effort pull, they're just going to be like a warm up for max effort pull and they'll be primed to be snappy. I'm going to be ready to go. It works that way. It just doesn't work the other way around if the goal of my speed squat is to actually do a real speed squat. If I wasn't doing a real speed squat, if I was doing something more hypertrophy oriented in that slot, I could pull first, do the hypertrophy oriented squat in the second slot because I won't need to be as spiffy, as snappy, as dialed in. But again, it's just make shit fit where it fits for your needs. Don't try to fit shit in the box and say, this is the only box it can go in. We don't have, you know, square pegs and square holes, round pegs, round holes. We're just gonna fucking just shove it in the fucking hole that it works the best in. So yeah. And more fitting tags in holes. Question number six, meet day attempt selection tips. I guess that's not really fitting pegs and holes, but I just wanted to say that. So here we are. The biggest thing that you need to understand about meet day attempt selection is after a meet, no one ever really has said, 
I wished I opened 20 kilos heavier, but you're damn sure that someone at some point, probably this last weekend even, has said, I wished I opened 20 kilos lighter because they fucking missed their opener then bombed out of the meat because they opened too heavy. So don't be the guy that opens too heavy and bombs out of the meat, or don't be the guy that opens too heavy and then takes the jump to a second and gets absolutely crushed by it. Open light enough that you can climb. Open light enough that if there is something weird on the platform, it's not so heavy that you're able to still adapt to it and then climb again. Open light enough that you're just not screwed over by your opener because that is the number one attempt mistake that people make is they just open too heavy and then they're screwed for the rest of the day. So don't be the guy that opens too heavy because if you open light enough, you're gonna be able to have a good second and you're gonna be able to have a good third. Your opener does not win a meet. Your opener sets you up to win a meet. Your opener does not hit you a PR total. Your opener sets you up to hit a PR total. So don't be the asshole that thinks he can open big and then he'll miraculously be able to pull two jumps out of their ass because more than likely you are not that guy. And for the final question of the day, what is the pathway from intermediate to advanced and how do you measure it i really don't freaking know especially like on the measurement part of things like this is something that i've always been confused by is like you'll see on like reddit forums like lifters being like i'm an advanced lifter what program should i do and then you ask them like what are their lifts and they're like 400 200 400 i am extremely advanced i'm talking about pounds not kilos either because if those were kilos that would actually be a good total but no they're pounds i total 800 fucking pounds actually a thousand i can't do math but they total a thousand pounds that think they're advanced. So like the whole, are you intermediate? Are you advanced? I think it's less about outright total. I think it's less about having like a marker to hit. I think it's more about how close are you to your actual ceiling and your actual capacities. And then when we start defining it as how close are you to your ceiling, and then it becomes a matter of asking, how do you get closer to your ceiling? And the way that we get closer to our absolute ceiling is by doing more of the right things more better. So where you are, no matter where you are, you can do more things better and you can do more of them. So just figure out what is the next thing that you can chip away at to improve, whether that be something as easy as just trying harder in the gym, whether that be learning to try better in the gym, whether that be learning to pick better excess selection, whether that be learning to better manage frequency, better manage periodization, whether that be learning to better manage your diet, just keep chipping away at things over time and you're eventually going to get there. I can't say this is the exact route to do it. I can't say this is the exact way to do it, but I can say that for everyone watching this, myself included talking about this, there are things that we can all do better and there are things that we just can keep working on. And the only way we're ever going to get to be as good as we can be is just by doing more of the right things, more better over more time. So guys, that is what I got for you today. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted the question. If your question did not get answered, I'm talking to you guys asking about elbows and shoulders. It is more than likely that it was already covered in a previous AMA or in a standalone video. So make sure to scroll through the channel to get your fix because there is a lot of good stuff here. And as always, this AMA series is brought to you by my upcoming Make Conjugate Work for Raw Powerlifting Lecture Series, where we're going to get deep into fitting all sorts of pegs and all sorts of holes so you can better understand how to design a conjugate periodization program to fit your needs. Because the whole thing about conjugate is it's impossible to make a freaking template that will work for everybody because the whole point of conjugate is the flexibility and allowing it to adapt to what the lifter needs on a given day, in a given training cycle, in a given meat prep so that it can work as effectively as possible for them. And if you watch the rest of the vlogs, you'll hear lots of discussion on me talking about the decisions I'm making in training and why I'm making those decisions. And just watching those vlogs will be able to paint a pretty good picture for you. But if you want it formally laid out, sign up for that lecture series because it is gonna be a freaking banger. And we got discount code for you. So if you type in YouTube at checkout because you're watching this on YouTube, you'll get 150 US dollars off of the price. So make sure to do that when you check out Peace out. Have a good night.